uh, imposter syndrome is actually something that hits high achievers at a higher rate than um, regular people. And now. <laughs> aye, aye. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Coming to you from the K2 Studios in San Diego, California. This sounds great. You sound amazing. I always sound amazing. It's the world famous. Everybody sit off like BFS. Chris and Christine Show. Hey, what's happening, everybody? How are you doing today? You know, thank you so much for listening, and I am Chris. And I'm Christine, and welcome to episode 118 of the Chris and Christine Show. Do 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 do. Fantastic. We are recording to you live from the Studio B in the house. <laughs> Studio B? I like that. Where is Studio B? Or should we call it the Annex? I like Studio B better. I'll tell you okay. why. Because the B stands for... Bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the bedroom. We are coming to you live from the bedroom because we had a few visitors over the house uh, over the weekend. Yeah, I like this whole setup. So why don't you walk everybody through, because I know that you like to nerd out on this stuff, how Chris, the master of podcasting, sets us up for... I would I would call this like semi-remote because we're not in like our regular stationary studio. So tell us the setup. Okay, so right now we are recording directly onto the MacBook Pro, uh, coming to you from the little office nook in the bedroom using the Zoom PodTrack P4. Is the Zoom PodTrack like, does it go with like Zoom video conferencing? It might. No, but is but it like made by those people? No, it's not. Oh, okay, tell us more. Actually, Zoom, I believe it's not Zoom.us, it's Zoom is the company that makes personal recorders. They oh, okay. do a lot of high end, like, Recording, recording, not so much like uh, big mixers, but it's mm-hmm. all handheld stuff. As you can see, the Zoom Pod Track is like the size of like a, a taser. I was just going to say, it's like the double taser size. It's weird. It looks like one of those things that I'd see in like Star Trek when they would like go up to somebody to like shock them and incapacitate them when it, it was like. Yeah. Bzz- and it might have been the design uh, yeah, scope they're looking for. Exactly. They're it was matching. a Trekkie. Yes. So <laughs> we have it. A lot of podcasters use this thing. Uh, we've used it maybe like three or four times since I've owned it. And um, the original the reason why I got it in the first place was because you can tr- uh, plug a phone directly into the thing and take phone calls like directly onto it, like super easy. And sometimes go through some software. You plug your iPhone, boom, right into it. Good to go. But Although, I'm looking like underneath and I don't see it plugged into the wall. So does it charge from the computer? Actually, it does both. But it has, it's funny, it has two plugs on it. One to plug to the computer and one to plug charge it. I only have one plug. So I have to use <laughs> choose, do I plug it to the computer or do I charge it? Well, obviously, I got to charge it, plug it to the computer. So it's, right now, it's running on batteries. Oh, okay. It just takes two double a batteries what happens if it runs out of batteries in the middle of an interview i guess we'll find out uh, <laughs> it probably just actually funny it did happen to me when i was uh, calling your sisters to do your fantastic birthday episode mm-hmm. i called them with the zoom pod track over the phone plugged oh, wow. right, yeah and um i was doing it with your sister uh one of your sisters kim. Aunt, i think it was kim yeah and it ran out of power oh, <laughs> on me no. while, I was, while i was on the phone with her all of a sudden i was like oh oh so then i had to, like pick the phone up and say hey hang on a second let me figure this thing out it uh, ran out of juice. But, oh, man. Uh, yeah, well, you know, live and learn, you know. Yeah, so does it do anything else other than just record audio? Uh, yeah, you can play little jingles like this. <laughs> That's like straight on it? It's not something, like you just pressed a button, so it's not like you have to go searching for something? No. It, you can, Well, you can upload stuff to it. There's some stuff that's already on, like that one's built into it. But uh, you can add some other ones. Let's see what else I got in here. I don't know if these are, but let's see what these, if these are here. I got four buttons. Let's see what this, okay. one, this one does. Oh, okay. That one's like a. You said something funny, honey. You're hilarious. The crowd loves you. Oh, that's annoying. Uh, well, let's see what this one is. Great story. <laughs> and Rick. I like that. What is that quote from? That's from uh, Anchorman. I was just gonna ask if it was. Yeah, and that wasn't that based Ron Burgundy in San yes, Diego. Yes, it was. <sighs> That was a good. That was a good movie. You know, I hadn't seen that until last year. But this is a pretty cool setup. I'm really enjoying it. I like it because it's just like a different vibe. And even though we have it here in our bedroom, it's not taking over the bedroom like the old podcasting studio used to when we had to like have podcasting slash sharing the master bedroom. I've noticed we don't fight as much over podcasting now that we actually have a dedicated studio space for it. 
Well, yes, dedicated studio space is correct. I just wish we had dedicated time to actually do it. Yeah, you Timing know. Timing is always the hardest thing that I, the hardest challenge that I've always found out was yeah. just finding time to physically do it. Like right now, I had to set everything up. You were running from the airport to get over here yep. just so we can podcast. And then as soon as we're done, shut down shop. We got to go back to work and figure uh, we got what stuff you have to do today. Yeah, I got a wedding coming up tomorrow. So it's a busy week. You know, tomorrow, I know this, you know, it might be today when you all are listening, is 2 No way. Is anybody getting married? Yeah, I'm having a wedding tomorrow. Well, I'm not getting married, but I am helping two people get married on Tuesday. That's funny. It's on a Tuesday. Like what? a TWO Tuesday no because way. it's 22222. What a trip. And they're getting married at 222 in the afternoon. Well, that's fantastic, baby. <laughs> I was thinking that maybe I should figure out how to put like 222 stems of flowers into their design to just like say, we did 222 florals on 22222. That would be really fun. You, th- you know what? You probably could do that. I don't think it'd count. They wouldn't count that. I count it no i know i'm sure you will but they won't count it no they they wouldn't but i could tell them and then it would be like my contribution to tuesday so i'm saying you tell them but you don't really do it well yes i would really do it i I think i could count it up we'll see i don't know if i bought that many flowers i think i have well i have a lot but i'm really excited to be able to do that tonight and um yeah kicking off wedding i mean wedding season's in full gear had a wedding this weekend (sighs) you know this weekend really was a fun filled Adventure. Let's just say that. <laughs> it was an adventure for sure. <laughs> so we had all three kids, uh, all three boys mm-hmm. here in town. Ezekiel flew into town. What's Friday night? Right? Yeah, Friday night. So Friday night, Ezekiel comes over. You got Mason and uh, Jacob and Ezekiel. All three boys in the house. And all- who was managing them? Uh, which day we're talking? Friday. So Friday night, my mom picked them up. Right. And then who was managing them? Uh, Me. Oh, you. Oh, well, good yes. job. Look at you. Yes, Look at you. Thank you. Wow. Took all of them out to dinner and the boys were wild because first night they get back together after being apart for a couple of weeks. They're crazy. And so then I had a wedding the next day and you and I talked about that because this wasn't supposed to be the weekend that Zeke was here, but he ended up being here. Why was that? Why was he not supposed to be here this weekend? Well, because he was supposed to be here the weekend before, but it was Super Bowl weekend. And that's always a big thing for him and his other family is to be able to watch the Super Bowl together. So he flip-flopped weekends, but I already had a wedding booked. So you, Mr. Wedding Helper Boy, said you would help me with whatever I needed when it comes to weddings. And that included... Yeah. Keeping all the kids. That's right. I did. And also, uh, speaking of my title, I do have a new title, a new job title. <laughs> you sure do. What is it? My new job title is I am the logistics manager of Christine Smith Designs. Okay. I had to, I had to actually plug you today. I have to t- explain this. So the person from Tough Sheds called to follow up on my estimate because I'd said for him to call back on Monday. And I saw the call coming through, but I was finishing up a Zoom call and I was like, oh, shoot, I need to email him back because I'm not going to go with Tough Shed. And so I wrote, uh, you know, dear such and such after or thank you so much for providing us with the proposal. After reviewing the scope of the construction with my logistics manager, we've decided that your current design doesn't fit the needs of the growth of my company. We've decided to go with the contractor (laughs) because it's true. I had you look over the, the estimate and tell me, you know, advise me on what well, you thought. we're still waiting for the estimate of the actual contractor. Do we have right. that yet? No, no. But he said like five days, which I think should be like tomorrow or the next day. Okay. Well, maybe. But we gave him a kind of complex setup. I, what I would probably have done is I would probably told Tough Shed to hang on to Tough Shed. Wouldn't respond right away. No. Just in case you got the other uh, bid come in. No, I didn't like their design. It was oh. just too standard. It was too cookie cutter. I know. Christine's building a palace in the backyard. I am. But anyway, so you have a new title. Yes, the logistics manager of Christine Smith Designs. Yes. What, I am. Um, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> it means you help me with logistics. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> when I talk to you about like how we need to structure things and like how the delivery would sh- should go, you always think of things from a logistical standpoint. And you're like, I'm the practical one. And I'm like, okay. That is true. It that is, is true. Well, mm, mm, kind of true. I'm very practical. You're practically... In love with yourself. Practically magical, <laughs> really. Magically <Unicorn>. delicious. <laughs> <laughs> that was slightly inappropriate. So, all right, so, so. What happened, so this weekend, we did have all three kids. And on Saturday, because Christine was busy doing her thing, I... Oh, I was busy working and earning money. I know. I was busy spending money. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So I took all three kids down to the beach, down to Belmont Park, 
on the Saturday. And the weather was decent. It was sunny, about 70 degrees. And because we get this big storm coming in through here this week, I can just see it now at the window. Oh my yep. gosh. It's getting windy. It's getting crazy. But we Batting have down those, the hatches. But we have those Belmont Park passes. So did that make it super easy for the boys? Like you just went Until to Until like- Chris grabbed the wrong passes. What? I grabbed the passes from 2020. What? I don't know why I still had them. I don't know why. So I go down there and I flip on the counter and they said, these passes expired like last year. Oh, no. And I'm like, no, I just bought them last year. <laughs> so luckily, they were able to look up the kids' birth dates yeah. uh, in the computer and they and they gave us new cards. Did or, they charge you for that? No, no oh, charge. They actually threw the old cards away. But it was so busy down there. Like I have never seen it that busy down there since like 4th of July or something. It was like yeah. crazy, crazy busy. Uh, the line for the roller coaster, like I don't remember the weight. But it, if you know, it wrapped down around the side and it went down to where the parking lot is. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Well, I, I, you know, it's a three-day weekend in San Diego because of President's Day. And I just got back from walking through the airport with Ezekiel. And it was crazy busy in the airport. There was a bunch of people flying to like Charlotte and Dallas. Like there were tons of people lined up. And I was like, this is crazy that Do there's you think so maybe many people. it was like a soccer team or something? No, it was like all different kinds of people. I don't know if it's like people came out here for the long weekend because they're finally starting to travel again with COVID kind of subsiding. I really don't know. All I know is people are everywhere again. And I'm just starting to realize that other than like being at weddings, I'm not much of a people person. Yeah. Um, or maybe you, I am. Yeah, I, I think know. you are. But, uh, you know, I think everybody's trying to adjust to this whole, like, being around big crowds again. Big, You know, like I seen at the Belmont Park yesterday or for Saturday, we were there in the arcade. Like, walking, navigating yourself through the arcade area was, like, almost like being in a busy club, nightclub back in the day. I used to go to clubs a lot. <laughs> and you hold your drink up top, like, above your head as you're, like, walking <laughs> through the crowd. Like, make sure you don't spill it. You're so it. funny. Because, like, you'll bump into somebody and, like, you'll spill it, right? Yeah. So, you have to, like, kind of, like, do the whole, switch, you know, shimmy around people and hold the... Uh, <laughs> you're dancing here in your seat trying to... If you, Okay. I wish that you all could see this. Um, there's some times where I wish that we actually had video on this podcast because Chris is literally sitting here, like, holding a make-believe cup over his head, wiggling his hips side to side like a cantina girl. Yep. But it's so funny when you're trying to describe that whole situation to me the other night when I got home, you were like, oh my gosh, it was so busy. It was like, you remember like being at the club back in the days when it would be all like everybody tight and you're like having to wiggle through. And I was like, nope. And you were like, yeah, you mean like at the clubs, like, you know, at the clubs. So I was like, no, I have no understanding of that. Like I went clubbing three times in my life and it was when i was 36 years old <laughs> oh it's like time. a long time ago huh? uh, oh all right <laughs> jokester whatever uh, 30 years ago yeah <laughs> you better watch it you better watch it little sarcastic i'm just kidding baby doll. i'm just kidding i know yeah and then you call me baby doll that's like a backhanded compliment old man oh i know yeah. who's, who's older here huh? mm-hmm, you are that's true <laughs> well cognitively or physically i might be smarter in terms of my maturity level <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever i know it's like totally you just did a clueless on me whatever for sure for sure uh, totally. So, anyways, yeah, you know. Um, so you took the boys to Belmont Park. Yeah, and it was busy. It was fun. It was funny leaving the place to come home. It's like you know we're, we're trying to find it's like dinner time. Like let's find some place to eat. So we decided to go over to. Well, first off, getting out of the area was just a madhouse. It took like an hour just to get to like where the freeway on right was. Okay, was this a real hour or is this like a, cra- a Chris over exaggerated hour? A little bit of both, I would say. A little mm-hmm. bit of both. Mostly a real hour for the most part. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we get to minus the, fifty-seven minutes. So we get up to the freeway, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, there's a Chili's right over there. We always go to that Chili's, just right there. Boom, get in, no big deal. So I head over to the Chili's, and I go pull into the parking lot. And first off, I can't find parking anywhere. And Why there's, not? there's, there's a, like a huge parking lot. There's like a stadium right there. Well, if the stadium is being used like it was that night for a hockey game, oh. then they were guiding cars. They made the Chili's parking like super small. Like the Chili's wasn't given that big parking lot. They were given like half of it or a corner of it. So they rope off the rest of the area for parking. They charge your parking to get into but the. But uh, what hockey team? Like San Diego doesn't have a hockey team. Yes, they do. What? What? It doesn't even snow here. Oh, does, does it have to? Is it like an NHL team? Oh, no. It's like minor, minor league. It's the uh, San Diego goals. What is a Like a goal? Like, like a no, hockey goal? No, like the bird. I've never heard of a goal. The goal, you know, the goals that fly around. You know, the birds. Come on. The only thing I've heard is a seagull. 
That's what it is, seagull. The no, it, nobody calls that a gull. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, they are. You know, they're playing. That's a, a dub. Well, the cat. Yeah. Good goals. I'm sorry, um, if for all of you that play on the team, I'm not dissing the fact that you have worked really hard to get there. You know, but pretty can we come up with a better know, name, like the you know attack birds or something? You know, it's funny when uh, San Diego when they had their indoor football team for a minute. I think it was called the Sharks or something. Why would you have a football team called the Sharks? Was it the Sharks, or was it the? Like sharks uh, don't even go on land. Or was it the, the stingrays? And then the same thing, like know. a gull can't even survive in the ice. Okay, who cares about that? I care. Okay, that's not the point. The point yes. is the, the place was crowded and we had a hard time parking the vehicle. And then we get there and I do a, a lap around the parking lot of Chili's and I like look inside the window. Wait, you did a lap? Like you literally got out of your car and you did a lap? Like I drove around the parking lot. Oh, that's not doing a lap. <laughs> and then I looked in the window and I realized, oh, that's like wall to wall people. Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, we're going to be waiting all night. Yeah. So I'm like, what else is there eat around here in this neighborhood? Oh, yeah. There was that pizza place, uh, Pyology, right across mm-hmm. the street. So I took the kids over there. Each of them ordered their own pizzas, which is great. And uh, we did that instead, and it was fun. But Mason hates pizza. He, he does hate pizza, but if it's cheese is the base of the sauce, they do have this Alfredo cheese sauce you can oh. get. He used that. He's like, oh, he loved that. He put mushrooms on there. That's and a dad he, hack right there. Way it, to go, babe. Uh, tell me about it. I brought him home, and then the next day, um, yeah, it was fun times today on Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, we went. Well, I mean, there's something going on. I think it is because everybody's coming out of COVID, and it's like all these people everywhere. We went to Dave and Buster's last night, and you walked in to get us a reserve or to get us a seat because they didn't take reservations. And what was the wait they quoted they you? They told me three hours. I told the lady, "Oh, what did you just say?" <laughs> and she said, three hours. I said, "Why don't you say three days?" Mother, you're at it, you know. Mother- <laughs> You know? Well, the people that we – so we were waiting for a seating kind of in the open seating area and there was these ladies. They had babies with them in their strollers. They were quoted five hours and it's like – How they, do you even know that you heard them say that? Yeah, because I was talking with them about like which tables we were all going to get. And we were like staking out the, the area to get those like first come, first serve seating. And I was like, yeah, they told us three hours and she said that they told them five hours. I said, they're not even open for five hours. And and she was like, yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, good tomorrow morning. <laughs> Or lunch tomorrow. Yeah. It's like, we're going to have an opening for you at 3.30 a.m. <laughs> that place was incredibly busy. Like, I don't know. They, they had these crazy arcade games and different – which is kind of cool because a lot of the old arcade games back in my day growing up, like a Chunky Cheese would have like the ski ball. Chunky Cheese? What did I say? Chunky Cheese. And <laughs> Chunky Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that Chunky Cheese? <laughs> you said Chunky Cheese. Isn't it called Chunky Cheese? Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, whatever. Like like Charles. Okay. Chuck E. Cheese, not Chunky. That's either here or there. But, uh, no, the- it's like, who wants to eat Chunky Cheese? <laughs> but it's really busy, and they have these cool arcade games, and I got to play the basketball stuff, which I usually am good at. And then Mason played some uh, Star Wars like virtual reality game. He did that, and I did this axe throwing game they had, and I did that, but the axe never stuck on the thing, so I think I'm doing it, doing it wrong. I don't know. Maybe. Just like you're saying Chunky Cheese. <laughs> I'm not gonna get over that. Well, we oh, had- by the way, the food at Dave Buster's not a fan. Oh, what? this is the first I've heard that you complained. Well, I'm, well, I'm saving it for the podcast. Oh, you know, I was just thinking about that. That you know, we haven't been around each other a lot because we've been so you know busy with our different projects. This kind of feels like we're one of those like talk show co-host duets where they don't talk to each other about what's happening outside of work until they get on the show so then they can like air all of this different stuff of what's actually well, like that's that's the whole point yes that, like, that's yeah. exactly right so maybe we should stay apart from now on so then we have no more. i could i couldn't do that i just don't like sharing everything with you until we get to the podcast uh, oh i thought you were just saying that you were you know not but talking that's to on- me for banter honestly honestly though like the last couple times i've been to dave and busters not a you know not to do a uh, Ruined. Not to dip on the or to, yeah. dip, to what's it called? Uh, rag on them, right? It's that I have not been a fan of their food. Well, you don't so honestly, couple, you, you don't go couple, there for the food, though. I think that's what it is. I think I, you go for the ambiance, it's and like, not the food. It's like kids go to Chuck E. Cheese, yeah, they, nice go, job. they go there for the fun and the tokens and the prizes, they don't go there for the pizza. I don't think it's kind of gourmet pizza there, yeah, or if they did, no, we, you're right, they don't, but. It's like, what if we just brought back old school arcades? But I think that the problem is, is that people wouldn't stay there very long because they didn't have food. So it's like, they give you like basically 
concessions, but, you know, with a bigger price tag. I know they got beer and they got drinks and they got that kind of stuff and a full-on bar and they got sports going on. And, and I'm sure they got basic stuff like hot wings and fries and stuff for like mm-hmm. bar type food. Like if you want to just go there to do that stuff, you can. And they got some cooler arcade games. I saw some new variations on things, you know, that I've never seen before, which are always fun to play with. Right. And they even got some, they even got some like, Regular computer, like a guy phone games, but like on guy phone games, I- iPhone games. Like oh, I thought you said guy phone games. I was like, what's a guy phone? <laughs> I effing don't know. So, um, like, uh, what's that? Uh, Fruit Ninja, they got the Fruit Ninja in real life. You can play. And what's that game? I haven't ever played it before. That's so old. They even have Candy Crush. Oh, I've never played that, but I've only seen it. Yeah, well, they got like the video arcade version of those things, you mm-hmm. know. The Fruit Ninja one, it's kind of fun. You like use your finger to swipe like a razor blade. Like your fo- mm-hmm. your finger is the blade, and the fruit flies up in the air. Oh, that's and, fun! And you gotta like swipe. Like- yeah, that's that's basically what you do. That's With, so fun. Without hitting the bomb, there's like bombs too. You gotta like swipe the swipe the fruit without hitting the bomb. Oh, that's super fun! So they had that game at yeah, the real game life Masters? yeah real life version of that. They've got Guitar Hero and the wait, kids like are- real life version. Like they throw up the fake fruit and then you have a knife. And you're like, you know, that'd be kind of fun. <laughs> they might have. You know, I'm surprised they don't have. They maybe they do. They might have like an actual like VR version of Fruit Ninja. Mm-hmm. They have that beat box or beater beat. What's it called? Laser beat thing. They got. Oh, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. While you all were out playing, I was stocking the table section for the first come, first serve seating. And then I was like waiting for 40 minutes. And I finally see this table. This man's like he motioning to me that they were going to leave. And so the uh, bus boy came to clean off the table right then. I literally sat down and you texted me, our table's ready. And it was like 45 minutes versus three hours. And I was like, our table is ready? And you're like, yeah, our table's ready. I'm already sitting down. I'm like, what in the world? And so I had to give up that table. And it was a comfy booth. I know. I sh- yeah, I should have jumped on your table. Our table was a little tiny little cracker-sized table. Well, that's all right. But, you know, we had a good weekend and gearing up for another busy week this week for both of us. And, you know, speaking of keeping busy, this week on our episode, we have a fantastic guest And she is a leadership development expert, and she's going to be back with us right after this. Hey, thank you so much for being a loyal listener of The Chris and Christine Show. And as that you are a loyal listener, we have a very fun opportunity for you to get involved with the show. Ooh, tell me more. If you like to get exclusive content you can't get anywhere else and to receive free merchandise shipped to you every single month. Ooh, I want that. Then head over to patreon.com slash the Chris and Christine show. That is patreon.com slash the Chris and Christine show. And welcome back, everybody. Today, we have another fabulous VIP guest. She is a speaker, a coach, an educator, and an author. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ruth Gautien. Hello. Welcome, guys. How are you? Fantastic. Well, thank you for uh, showing up here today. Yeah, we appreciate you flying all the way out to the K2 studios. Where was it that you flew in from? From New York, where it is cold. So I'm going from cold to colder. (laughs) But I'm so excited (laughs) to be here with you guys. Fantastic. fantastic. Are you like in the actual like city of New York City, like the heart and thick of it all, like like the Times Square? The heart and soul of New York City. Oh, that's so wonderful. Now, are you like a born and bred New... I don't know. Do we call them New Yorkians? Oh, New, New Yorkers, Yorkians. right? Well, yeah, New, New, New Yorkers. Yorkers. I have lived in New York for almost my entire life. So, yeah, this is my city. Wow. That's awesome. Now, we've had a couple of guests from New York recently, and we have to ask a question because I'm trying to figure out if everybody answers the same way. What is your favorite type of food to have in New York? <laughs> Well, the great thing about New York is that you don't need to pick just one because (sighs) we are the melting pot. So Italian and Indian and Thai and Chinese. I mean, you name it. I heard you guys got pretty good seafood though, right? In New York? 
I don't eat seafood, so I wouldn't oh. know. Oh. oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> Neither do I. See, Dr. Ruth, we are on the same, same well, wavelength with that one. I just, I just thought it's close to the water. I just put t- one of one together, maybe, you know? Uh, I don't know that that water know. you want seafood from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you ever had sushi in Nebraska? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a goofball today, Chris. Uh, but Dr. Ruth, and all joking aside, we really do appreciate you being on the show with us today. And uh, we've been reading about you and researching about you and would love to know a little bit more about your professional background and what it is that you do for a living. Sure. I actually started out in banking and finance, international banking, And uh, after two years, realized that you can be good at something and not enjoy it. So I switched into the world, switched back into the world of higher education. But I had worked with undergrads. And this time I wanted, I really wanted people who had too much to lose. I said, what's the most competitive program? I'll run that. (laughs) And I realized that it is what's called an MD, PhD program for the students who get the dual MD and PhD degrees. Oh, wow. And I ran that program cradle to grave, as we say, recruitment, admission, student affairs, budgets, grants, um, operations, crisis management, marketing, alumni affairs, you name it, I did it. And then at the age of 43, I decided to go back to school and get my doctorate, which I did while working full time and raising my family. And from there, I designed and launched a mentoring academy and became assistant dean for mentoring. And now I'm a chief learning officer at Weill Cornell Medicine and the author of the book, The Success Factor, because all of my research has been about studying extreme high achievers, the Nobel Prize winners and astronauts and Olympic and NBA champions. And I put all the golden nuggets that I have learned into this book, into the success factor. Fantastic. That's now, amazing. I oh, Go ahead, Chris. I'll, I'll ask just say a question success, after. Uh, success uh, factor. Everybody you mentioned there has a different version of what success means for each of them. Now, mm-hmm. do you have like, uh, how do you figure that out between the different <laughs> people? Yes. So actually, you know, what do you know, Chris? But um, success changes based on who you ask. And success is a moving target. So, which is why you never actually reach it. There's always more Wait, to what do. Se- what are you saying here? <laughs> <laughs> There's always more to do. But my early research was actually trying to define it, right? Because how can you have a goal for something that you can't even recognize? So um, my original research was about defining it. And the way I defined it for the success factor and how I defined these extreme high achievers are people who push the needle on what we know to be true. They created a paradigm shift in the way we work, think about things, process things. They're recognized for their achievements. And as they start being recognized and they start moving up in their career, they are bringing other people up with them because they fully recognize that a spotlight on them or a spotlight on someone else does not detract from the spotlight on them and they make it their mission to bring other people up with them. I love that because, you know, when we think of successful leaders, uh, we typically look to the ones who are more relational or empathetic and trying to be supportive versus leaders who are more dictators and trying to like squash other people down did you find that there was something common in the upbringing of these individuals to help them be that type of successful in a positive way? It's so interesting. I was looking for that, but I didn't see that because they each grew up under very different circumstances. Some were the first in their uh, family to go to college. Other people, they had parents who were physicians or great athletes, um, as the case may be. So everyone came from something very, very different, but every single one of them surrounded themselves with a team of mentors who believed in them more than they believed in themselves. And I think that's what really made the difference for them. Did you find that with these successful people that they struggled with imposter syndrome or feeling like they Mm. weren't enough? Or is that something that they never grappled with? 
Oh, no, they I think it uh, imposter syndrome is actually something that hits high achievers at a higher rate than um, regular people because, yeah, because, you know, and that's why uh, there's so many people. Michelle Obama has it. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor has it. Oscar winner Tom Hanks, um, uh, um, the the Grand Slam winner. um, Garth Brooks. um, He's not the Grand Slam winner, Chris. The the, the tennis. uh, um, Serena Williams. Serena Williams. Thank you. I was just thinking about how Garth Brooks has it, too. I heard he has it, too. I'm sure he does, because what happens is you're hitting these achievements and you don't recognize it. And your brain is really confused. Like, what is this? And that's why so many actually have the so many have imposter syndrome. And in fact, Uh, I'll share a funny story. Um, Thinkers 50 is, they're the number one group for identifying the top management thinkers in the world, right? This is the list to get on. And I'm part of that Thinkers 50. And I was in the backstage during the award ceremony. And here I am with all of the the big winners, right? right? And every single one, as they got their big wins, they're saying, oh my God, I don't deserve this. Oh Oh my God. Oh my God. And I kept thinking and I said to the co-founders, I said, oh, we have like raging imposter syndrome here. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I got my award and now because it was virtual, they had to ship it to us. I got the the radar award. It sat in the box for a week. Oh, I was wow. afraid to take it out because I and I told him I said I was sure you were Wait, going what, to email what is the me and say we made award? a mistake. <laughs> what, what, what is the doctor or what Ruth? What is the radar award? Is it something you get for being a space cadet or what? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, it's the number one emerging management thinker in the world. Oh wow! Congratulations! Congrats on Thank that. you. I Thank you. So uh, almost a space a cadet. <laughs> <laughs> Because because your thinking is out of this world, right? It, my thinking is out of this world, but it you know it's so funny when I got it. As I said, it stayed in the box because I was sure they were going to send me an email saying we made a mistake. Can you please send oh, it back? No, it's got to be the worst feeling ever. And they didn't do that. Well, lucky you. <laughs> it's still lucky you. Fine. But this is really I, you know it happened with the astronauts, the Nobel Prize winners, the Olympic champions. They all mm-hmm. felt this way. So. Yeah. And, you know, Chris and I talk about this a lot because we try to stay humble and anytime success comes our way, it's it's something that I don't mean to speak for you, Chris, but it's something that you and I have talked about extensively. Like when good things happen in your life, you're always like waiting for the other shoe to drop like, oh, I don't deserve mm-hmm. this. And, and I know that I deal with that, too. Is there something that you think is the root of that for all people? Have Has your research unveiled anything around that? Well, it's really because this is new to us. It's not something routine, and we just don't know how to grapple with it. And this, again, is where a team of mentors is so helpful because they can give you that dose of reality and remind you why you earned it, why this is rightfully yours, why you deserve the spotlight, why nobody's going to take it away from you. And one of the things that I realized with all of the extreme high achievers is that they were incredibly humble. Mm -hmm. I mean, incredibly, so much so that when I reached out to them and I said, look, you came up on my scores as an extreme high achiever. I'd love to interview you for my research. And they all said, I am. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know, I, feeling. Said, I know what you mean. <laughs> you know the feeling. <laughs> and I said, but you won the Nobel Prize. I, if you're not a high achiever, what does that say about the rest of us? Right. So, right. That's a bunch so of losers, they're... you know, over here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they are extraordinarily humble and they're great well, to let, be around. Well, let's pause for a second on, you know, your book and float back a little bit because you listed some of your accomplishments very quickly and I want to dive into those a little bit more because you've been very successful in your career. Uh, you talked about earning your doctorate, which is not a small accomplishment while raising kids and a family. Christine knows uh, best. Yeah, so tell us a little <laughs> bit about that journey for you. First of all, what did you study? Um, how did you make it through and how did you determine success for yourself? 
So I was determined, I mean, laser focus. And that happens when you go back to school later in life. Mm -hmm. It's really about perspective, right? I was doing it because I wanted to do it. My bachelor's and master's, I did it because I had, it was expected, I had to do it. But this was, I really wanted to learn. There were questions I really wanted to understand and to study. And it was different from any other experience I had when you go back later in life and you're doing it for yourself and the teacher gives out the syllabus and there's required reading and recommended reading. You do that recommended reading, right? right? And you love it. And then you start going to the references in the book or the article, and then you start reading those and then you start asking questions and then you start making connections. And trust me, I was trying to get my hands on everything and really learn as much as I can. So my degrees in adult learning and leadership, I was studying success. At that time, my dissertation was on the most successful physician scientists of our generation. Mm. And that really launched all of this work. Uh, And then it just continued for years after with the astronauts and Olympic champions and NBA champions and people like that. So I loved it. That's so intriguing. (laughs) Now, going through the the doctoral process, since I'm newly through that and have a lot of friends that are just on the other side of it. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, I just graduated in May. Um, (gasps) And so thank you so much. And mine was an organizational change in leadership. But one of the things that I... Yes. So one of the things that I noticed amongst my colleagues that are graduating is, first of all, we look around and we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I made it. And mm. what if people start calling me doctor? Like, I don't like, I don't feel like I'm that. But then there's this <laughs> other dynamic of now what? You know, people, when you go through your doctorate, they say, oh, well, why are you getting it? Not mm-hmm. like they ever ask you for your bachelor's. Like, oh, in your bachelor's, it's like, well, what are you majoring in? But it, with your doctorate, well, why do you need that for? And people are like, well, I don't know how to justify it. So did you feel a need right after you finished your doctorate to like prove that you got it for a reason and have to do something with it right away? No. Um, And the reason is because when you get it later in life, you learn that other people's judgments, you can either decide to let it affect you or not. And I decided life is too short to let other people's judgments affect me. So I was doing it for myself. I was not trying to explain myself in any way to anyone. Mm. It took me years to learn to be called doctor. Um, but once once you do, you do. Um, mm-hmm. But um, it's really not about other people's – they're not going to understand it no matter what you say to them. Oh, good So point. I just decided to save my breath, put my head down, focus on my work – they understand achievement, that they understand. Right. Success, they understand and they recognize it when they see it. And I decided that was going to be my my driving motivator. Fantastic. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> that's, here we are. Yeah, that's a really good point about like not getting caught up in other people's opinions. And Chris, you and I have had conversations about this frequently about, you know, whether or not we let other people's opinions and judgments impact us. And and so how did you lift well, up? We're bombarded beyond- by it all the time, every right. day. We, we yeah. are because, I mean, I mean, we do live in a world where people see you and they do see your accomplishments and they do get very, they look at themselves and they figure out like, why not me? Why, mm-hmm. why is that person so much more successful than I am? Like, they mm-hmm. almost feel like it's hard to explain, but uh, there's a bit of a sadness that kind of comes in, maybe jealousy too, perhaps, you know, yeah. and then it can kind of turn flip around the other way to where they're looking at you differently, and kind of like a give you the stink eye, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you navigate that? I know that you talked about like getting to a certain age where other people's opinions don't matter, but what's part of that process? Because I know that that has a role to play in being successful, like not getting up, getting caught up in other people's opinions. 
Yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, now it's easy for me because whenever people say, you know, why are you more successful? I just hand them my book, The Success Factor. I'm like, you want to do it? Here it is. Um, here's the blueprint. You literally wrote the book on it. I literally wrote, wrote, the wrote the book. I wrote the book on it. That's why. Okay. There you go. There you go. Um, look, I, I just decide. So you, you're actually in this field. So you might have studied group relations mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the balance of Velcro and Teflon. Oh, and, I've never heard that. What's that? Oh, so the valance of Velcro means every time somebody rolls their eyes at you, sucks their teeth, ignores you, turns their back at you, you whatever it is, right, gives you the stink eye, you can let it stick to you. But what happens is when it sticks to you, it's not just that one thing that's sticking to you, it's everything else. And they start to stick to you and stick to you and stick to you until it starts to weigh you down, until you are a shell of your former self and you don't even remember who you used to be. Mm. Or you can let it just glide off of you like Teflon. There you go. Right? Yeah. Water mm -hmm. off a duck's back. And trust me, I was the queen of Velcro. I was so sensitive and anybody who said any negative remark, I would think about it for weeks and I couldn't get anything else done. Oh, Christine, you hear about that? <laughs> why, are you, why are you putting me on blast, Chris? <laughs> well, that's, you now, know. I decided one conference over one weekend where I didn't really know anyone. I was going to take on the valance of Teflon mm. and it was the most liberating experience absolutely liberating. And I've never looked back since. But how did you physically go about that? Because saying it and doing it are two different things. Because going from being like, super sensitive to where everything affects you to being basically bulletproof without coming across as conceited or cocky, Mm -hmm. There's nothing like, wrong with that baby doll. <laughs> yeah, <there it is>. <laughs> <laughs> because you wanted to stay, you always want to stay humble and kind, but yeah. not let other people's opinions of you like impact you. So how did you do yeah. that and, and stay so nice? <laughs> oh, well, first of all, I managed the poker face. I like, Ooh. I really See, perfected the poker face. <laughs> um, I also hung around that weekend at the conference with a bunch of officers from West Point Ooh. who are the kings of Teflon. Mm. And they really have mastered it. I mean, clearly have mastered it. And I was just learning by observation how they were doing it. And I said, I, I want to I want to be like that. And I tried it for that one weekend. And in fact, one guy at the end, they said, oh, I thought you were so mean and blah, blah. Like, I didn't say a word. It was because I didn't say a word. And so they, they took the silence instead of my lashing back when something bad happened, they took the silence as a, you're just mean. And then they see me <laughs> cracking up, smiling and laughing at the end. And they're very confused. <laughs> I said, no, this is who I am. I just chose not to react to all that negativity. Mm, Instead of reacting, I was responding. And you were so heated, right? Because th this is a type of uh, conference where everything gets heated. Mm -hmm. You were so heated that nothing I could have said or done was going to affect you in any way. So I decided not to engage. Mm -hmm. And you decided that that made me mean, <laughs> I decided I kept my sanity <laughs> right? because I was not going to engage with the negativity. But now you know me for who I am. You know that I am just, you know, radiating smile. And when you are ready to respond and not react, I would love to go for coffee and have a conversation with you, but learn to respond before you react. I love that. And I think that that's a really valuable lesson for so many people is, you can choose whether or not to engage in heated situations or emotionally charged situations or respond to or react to people's yeah. opinions of you and learning like building that muscle because it really is like working out, building that muscle yeah. of not engaging mm -hmm. to with that kind of negative or destructive pattern of behavior actually builds a different type of muscle, which 
helps you to learn resilience, emotional resilience too. But I would think so also true. that you yourself probably know you better than they do. So don't listen to them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so true. Well, with the successful people that you profiled, did many of them struggle with any types of like negative self-talk or is that something that they'd had to conquer? Every single one had to conquer it in some way. And this all goes back again to that team of mentors, right? Because think of Dr. Peggy Whitson, who was one of the astronauts who I interviewed. She was a biochemist. She had worked at NASA for years and years and years. And she applied to be an astronaut and was turned down. And then she applied again and was turned down. And this went on for 10 years. Oh, my goodness. For 10 years. And she kept at it. She kept going at it. And finally, she got accepted. And it's a good thing that she didn't give up because she ultimately became the first female commander of the International Space Station. A oh, role wow. she's held twice. She became NASA's chief astronaut. And she holds the record for more days in space than any American astronaut of any gender. Well, I, wow. guess, I guess the big question is, what was NASA's problem? I mean, what, did, you know, what took them so long? <laughs> well, well, you know, there, of all the astronauts who I interviewed, there was only one who got in on the first try. Oh, oh. really? Yeah. Well, well, now, what happened with that? Was that they knew the boss or? The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> he is a, that's Scott Parazinski. He is a physician. He's a scientist. He is an astronaut. He is um, an Olympic luge coach, and he climbed Mount Everest. He makes the rest of us look lazy. Wow. <laughs> okay, I, I have to tell you really something. Nice yeah. guy. <laughs> I have to tell you something because you mentioned luging. I mean, it's completely off topic, but it was hilarious. So I'm going to just insert this here. Chris, you'll appreciate this too. I was driving down the highway right after I landed in Utah with my rental car uh, just a couple of days ago. And over the freeway, it said... Um, Speeding is for, I thought it said Lugers. And I was like, what's a Luger? And it was like, slow your pace. And I was like, what's a Luger? And then I was like, Luger, because I'm near Park City. Oh, I was thinking like, what's a Luger? Is this like Utah Lugie speak? Or what are you talking about? <laughs> so I'm sorry. I just had to insert that little funny bit That's because you funny. talked about luging coaches. But um <laughs> So, you know, you've done this work around the success factor. You obviously have found some success for yourself, but outside of your book, how do you start to build this environment of success as it relates to your own role as a chief learning officer and dean of mentoring? So look, I was patient zero mm -hmm. when it came to this. When I realized the four elements of success that all of these successful people do, before I could ever put pen to paper and write the book, I had to see if this really works, if this can work on the average person. And as I said, I was patient zero. I tried it on myself. And here it is. Here we are. It really, really works for anybody who wants to elevate their success. So the way I see it is my job as chief learning officers to make people successful in the way that fits for them in the way that they define success. And mm -hmm. I am constantly trying to find innovative ways to help people grow and soar because Christine, what works for you may not work for me. Right. right so we yeah. need to find these different avenues for people. And we are constantly just creating all kinds of programs and one-on-one -on -one, and it's really taking all of those best practices and just amplifying them. Ruth, um, as far as success goes, what is like the craziest outlandish success target that anyone has put out there? And what is the, the lowest target anyone's put out there for you? For me personally? Yeah, what have they said? Like, like oh, my target is this, or my target's that. Oh, for people that she's working with and yes. like helping to define yes. success for them? Yeah. Um, I think it's different because I, I think they're still trying – to work at it. And we don't really focus on the five and 10 year goals. I really focus on what is your next goal. Okay. Because oh, 10 yeah. year goals, they can change, but your next goal gives you a target, gives you something to focus on. And that's what I really work on people because that is tangible, that I can help you, that we can come up with a plan. And once we come up with a plan, we just attack it. That's what we're all about. So, so Chris, let me let me Go ahead. Hop, hop in here for just a quick second. So I'm thinking right now, Dr. Ruth, about 
so many of the younger generation that are entering the workforce, we've heard about like the Gen Z and the millennials, how they don't always have like a really clear path of what they want to do. They want to feel that they are respected and valued and have impact in their organization. And they're not necessarily chasing the next promotion. So do you find that in your role as chief learning officer, you have to adapt based off of the generation of the worker that you're engaging with? It is a little bit different, but especially I work in academia. So it there really is a lockstep of what it is that you are supposed to do, but how you're supposed to get it is very different for every person. Mm. So when it comes to the physicians and scientists I work with, there's pretty much a plan. Um, the staff, a lot of them is really figuring it out. And it's really, um, and I do this with the faculty as well, is really tapping into what I call their intrinsic motivation, what comes mm -hmm. from within. And one of the first things that we do is actually work on a passion audit to figure it is, figure out what it is that they love to do. Oh, that sounds interesting. Like hobbies and stuff or just, I mean, or is it career oh, type more. stuff? Oh, tell us. I'm very intrigued by this. <laughs> it is your calling. It's what you were put on this earth to do. Oh, I hear you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right? It's more than a hobby. Now, this is what makes people truly successful. Now, what happens is that our intrinsic motivation can change over time, especially when there's a transition in your life, right? So a new job, a new partner, a new child, a move, a pandemic. So we need to actually take a fresh look at it on a regular basis, especially when there is a transition. So I actually take people through this three column exercise and it's one of the um, downloadable features that comes with the success factor with the book, which is figuring out what it is that you're good at, what it is that you are good at but do not enjoy doing, what it is that you don't like to do, and what you would do for free if you could. Now, what's interesting is there's actually been research that says you only need to spend 20% of your time doing what you love in order for the other stuff to not burn you out. So we need to find something that you can spend at least 20% of your time doing, which is not very much. Hey, Christine, you hear that? Yeah. So say that one more time, because I want our listeners to hear that too, because sometimes people hear like, I have to chase my passions and leave everything nope. else behind. But tell us oh, that no. statistic again. Only 20%. You only need to spend 20% of your time doing what it is that you love in order for the other stuff not to burn you out because this is your light. This is this is what inspires you. And it can really have a ripple effect on everything else. So you only need to spend 20% of your time doing that. So Ruth, um, what if you spend more than 20%? What, what happens then? Like say 50%. If you try to do 50-50, what happens? He's asking because that's how much he tries to podcast. I'm just saying that, well, Dr. Ruth. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out my game plan here. <laughs> So, all right, you, you went out for a second. What What is that question again? So, so he was saying, uh, what, what happens if I it's 50%? Thinking. Ooh, 50% that you get to do, you, you're, you know, you won the lotto. You won the lotto if you can spend half your time doing what you love. Oh, that's beautiful. Don't See? leave. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that has been interesting to me is, you know, after I completed my doctorate, I was kind of in this space of what next, because there were mm. pressures to pursue promotion within my day job, which is in education. But I really, Chris really actually encouraged me to start really seeking out what my passions are. And I yep, love, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love love and I love weddings. And so I've built this uh, very successful wedding business in a pretty small amount of time for like wedding planning and floral design. And it was very interesting to me because I was at a, a work trip for a couple of days and we had some downtime and so we could do some personal things. So I was pulling up and catching up on some business emails on my personal computer. And the person that was leading this team, is, he said to me, you seem really passionate about that. Why don't you just go pursue that full time? And it was like, well, if I wanted to pursue it full time, I don't know if it would give me as much joy because then I have to rely on it 
to yeah. pay all the bills, to do all of this. And it might take a little bit of the magic away, but I'm yeah. okay with carving out, you know, evenings and weekends. And I thought I was just being crazy, but it sounds like this kind of fits with what you're saying. You see, you see, mm. look, Christine, I think you're going to love the introduction of the success factor because it really too. talks about this. This introduction really sets the stage. You're, I think you're going to love it. And well, I'm not going to lie. While, you. you've been, while you've been talking, I actually was pulling up your book and I see because right where I'm staying, there's a Barnes and Noble that's like literally 10 what? feet away from what here. What is a Barnes and Noble? Do they still have those? <laughs> yes, they do. And I was like, okay, so when we get off of this call, can I just like literally run across the walkway between meetings and go grab it? And the answer is yes. Yes, yes. I can. Hopefully they have it. Yes, I did check. They do have it in stock. There's only one <gasps> copy left. Yay. There you go. But she, we need to have an autograph. So Ruth, get your brother over here and, and sign it for her, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> but with this book, what was your whole idea? Like what impact did you want to ha- make by writing this book? Look, I don't believe anybody wakes up in the morning aiming to be average. I think people want to be successful. They've been trying out all these random things like waking up at 5 a.m. and reading for eight hours a day. And it doesn't really work because they were copying other people's habits instead of emulating their mindsets. So my goal is to inspire anybody who wants to be more successful, to give them the tools to be able to do it. And instead of talking about one day I'm going to be successful, you can start making steps, taking steps today and turning that one day and making today day one. And if my book inspires just one person to do that, then my mission is done. And look, the book just came out a couple of weeks ago and my, there's nothing I love more than reading the reviews on Amazon and the DMs that I get from people who have read the book and how they They are telling me about the impact, the positive impact it's had on them. I saved and screenshotted every single one of them because when I'm stuck, when I get into that dark place of why am I even doing this, right? The imposter syndrome kicks in. These are the messages that I look at. It's very true. It's the same thing goes for, uh, goes for podcasting too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is that we have um, reviews and comments and whether it be on social media or Apple podcast reviews, you can give us a five star if you like. And <laughs> um, But uh, you read those and they do give you a little gas in your tank to keep going, doing yeah. it, you know. Well, I think like yeah. all of us want to know that we've made a difference in this world in some way. And it seems like everybody is, I wouldn't say struggling, but wrestling with what is my legacy and what is my impact Mm. going to be. And so if our listeners are tuning in right now and they're struggling with that, like they don't know what their passion is, they're kind of unclear with what they want to do with their future um, or any of those kind of typical soul searching types of questions, what do you recommend for them to help get them started in clearing up their thinking? So first of all, Go read the success factor. (laughs) Um, But look, if you really want some things before you even get motivated with that, there's a ton of articles that I write about this that you can just go on Forbes or Psychology Today, put in my name and start reading those articles to really start revving up your engine. And then if you want to start figuring out what it is that you are passionate about, there, I think doing that passion audit will really start to help clarify things for you. And I do have a version of that passion audit right on my website that people can download for free. It's ruthgotian.com slash passion audit. I love word. that. Now, do you have any tools for couples like Chris and I? Because if we're both in this <laughs> crossroads where we're both struggling with really honing in on what our passions are and we want them to bring us closer together, not further apart. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you have any tools or tips for us as a couple on how to navigate this road together? I think you each need to do this passion audit and figure out if you're going to do this, how you're going to work with each other in order to actually make it happen. And I bet once you figure out what your passion is, I bet each of you has a strength 
that will compensate for the other person's area of opportunity. And you can actually help each other out. And that would be an encouragement and a fire to your inspiration. Teamwork. Here we come. <laughs> Team Chris and Christine. Just like the podcast. Hey, uh, but, uh, Ruth, I was going to ask you here is that uh, one thing I was here about is that in your expertise, when you talk about success, what do you think a successful person does that a, su- a not so, so successful person does? Like, how do you, like, what do they do that the other person does not mm. do? So actually, the research is crystal clear on this. Those who are successful do four things, and they do four things in unison. And again, these are not habits. We cannot copy somebody else's habits, but we can emulate their mindsets. So the first thing that all high achievers do is that they tap into what we call their intrinsic motivation right? This is what they are doing. This is their calling. This is their fire in the belly. It's not about the promotions, the awards, the diplomas. That's extrinsic motivation. That's when other people are judging you. That is not sustainable long-term. So they have tapped into their intrinsic motivation and they put gas on that fire. That's number one. Number two, They have the perseverance, the work ethic, the resilience, the grit, whatever you want to call it. And what happens is when you figure out what it is that you love doing, you're going to outwork everyone, but not 18 hour days. You're going to capitalize and leverage your peak performance hours. Also, the way they look at challenges is a, a little bit different. They never question if they will overcome it. They know that they will. Instead, they focus on how. What is the strategy I haven't thought of yet? The third thing that they do is they have a super strong foundation, which they're constantly reinforcing. What worked early for them in their career will work later for them in their career. They Mm. don't give up those basic skills just because they receive notoriety. And last but not least, you heard of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Mm -hmm. Mark Cuban, who are notorious for reading three to eight hours a day. But that's not what made them billionaires. What made them billionaires is that they were open to new knowledge. They were looking at how things are done in other places and looking for gaps in people's understanding. They were looking at how things are done in one program, in one institution, in one organization, and finding a way to do it slightly differently in a new way somewhere else. That's innovation. So while reading books is great for some people, maybe like Buffett and Cuban and Gates, there are other ways that you can open up your mind to new knowledge. You can read books, you can read articles, you can watch LinkedIn learning courses, you can watch YouTube videos, you can listen to podcasts. Hopefully we're sharing good stuff here. (laughs) Webinars, I mean, it's endless. And of course, they also surround themselves with a team of mentors because they learn by talking to other people as well. I guess basically always always be learning, right? Always be learning. Now, Dr. Ruth, for those that have listened to all of this and they're thinking, I really like this concept of finding a mentor, what tips would you give them as they look out for someone that might be a good mentor for them? Never, never, never ask somebody to be your mentor. Because when <laughs> you ask them to be your, me- yeah, I know. When you ask someone to be your mentor, you're actually asking them to take on another responsibility, another mm. obligation. And nobody has time for that. That's true. So instead, ask them for their perspective. Oh, okay. Say, Chris, I'm thinking of starting a podcast. I know you have experience. Can I just ask you a few questions about some of the best platforms? Or the best microphones, uh, right? Maybe. If I got time, uh-huh. I don't know. <laughs> but that's a lot better than, can you mentor me on starting a podcast? Like, where do you even start with that? I would say, sure. <laughs> yeah. I would say, sure. How much you got? <laughs> <laughs> right? But if you ask for perspective, that's actually very different. So you really want to surround yourself with interesting people because that's how you can learn. And you want people who are senior to you at your level and junior to you. And you want to create an entire mentoring team that has people from different diverse backgrounds and industries um, and ways of thinking. That's a really good point because I've have had multiple people in my life who I see as mentors. So there's that's an interesting point that you bring up that you know don't ask somebody to be your mentor because I think of those that have 
been the ones that I view as my mentors. I never asked them. It just kind of evolved into that. And they, you know, I asked them, oh, could you, could I pick your brain about this? And then Mm -hmm. we have ongoing conversations. And the same goes for individuals who've called me mentors. I was like, I didn't realize that they saw me as a mentor. That's so flattering. And I'm like, but I guess I kind of was. And I see the same thing for Chris as he has his other podcast called Podtastic Audio, where we have these up and coming podcasters reaching out to him. Chris, babe, you really are mentoring all of these people that are reaching out to you. I know I am. Star. <laughs> I thank you. I know I am. Yeah, people come to me all the time asking questions and stuff, and I'm like, oh, I'll see what I can do. You know, I help them out with what I can. But then you have others that you look up to and that you reach out to and ask questions here and there also. Yeah, circle of life. We all go around. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I have really appreciated all of this insight, Dr. Ruth. And you mentioned that the success factor just came out a couple of weeks ago. So for our listeners who are really intrigued, and this has kind of whet their appetite around success, where can they find your book and find you and connect with you? Absolutely. The book is called The Success Factor. Wherever you love buying books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, it is all there. Wherever you are in the world, I'm sure you have an international audience. If you want to know where to find it, you can go to ruthgotian.com slash book, and it'll tell you everywhere in the world where you can actually find the book, The Success Factor. And I am all over social media. It's just my name, Ruth Gotian. Perfect. And I'll put links to all of this in the show notes below. Awesome. And we want to thank you so much for being here with us. We know that you have a very busy schedule, motivating and empowering leaders and learners from all different walks of life. And so we just want to say on behalf of our entire listening audience, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. I loved it. Hey there, K2 crew. We love having you as our loyal listeners. To keep up to date with what's happening behind the scenes, check us out on social media. Yeah, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget to follow our Facebook page. Yeah, tag us in your favorite fun stories. And guess what? You might just end up on the show. So, Chris, I really loved how Dr. Ruth Gotien, I want to make sure I pronounce it right, Dr. Gotien was talking about the difference between like successful versus less successful people being related to reading. Now, I haven't been reading a lot of books, but I read like online news articles and things like that. You know, I think it pretty much covers pretty much, I think that like when people say read a lot, I would think articles and uh, things of that sort, magazine articles mm-hmm. or even online, you know, stuff like that's, news sources. Yeah, and things like that. As long as you're reading words other than, men's room, ba- a girl's bathroom? No, I think it needs menu. to be something that actually makes you grow. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't qualify Wikipedia as being something that would help you like grow in your First understanding. Off, <laughs> I check Wikipedia for the facts. I of, am telling you, Wikipedia is not reliable. But you know what's cool about Wikipedia? I can tell you this though, is that Wikipedia, like say you want to know something that happens in, like I was interested in the Walking Dead show, right? Before I started really diving into it and, and becoming a binge watcher every week. Uh-huh. I was trying to catch up and I would like read about different things. So they'd have like a Wikipedia would have like a breakdown of kind of each episode oh, yeah. or actually more better than this. It was the the comic books. Mm-hmm. So in the comic books in the future, because the show was kind of keeping pace with the comic books. Oh, got it. To kind of see what next season was going to be about. Mm-hmm. You'd see the Wikipedia about the show and then have a breakdown of this episode of this magazine or whatever comic book, kind of like a, like a, what do you call it? Cliff notes version. Uh huh. Of each thing. That's how I read. So it's basically like spoiler alert. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So I have to tell you something about Walking Dead. So first of all, you know that I don't watch that show because it creeps me out. But so I'm going to get to it. But there's this new service that I don't know if you've heard of and it's called Cameo. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I've seen. I don't know what it is though. I see the logo for it. I have no idea. So here's what it is, is you can purchase a Cameo from... A famous person that you that you know no or that you would like to way. know, yeah, and they custom record it for you or for somebody that you're gifting it to, and it's like a minute to two minutes, and it has different price points. So you have like the one that's for personal use, like for birthdays and celebrations, and then yeah. you could, and it's like you know sixty. Well, it's the sliding scale based off of the fame of the person. So it's like, so how much could we get for our fame? So, <laughs> well, I'll get to that. So it's like fifty dollars or like forty five dollars to like 
you know, $100 for the short cameo for personal use. But then if you're going to use it for like promotional marketing and website kind of stuff, then you can pay like $200 or $300. But I was really thinking like, maybe this was last week. I was like, one night I was saw this up um, a cameo from one of the Instagram influencers that I love watching because she's hilarious. Her name's Elise Myers. And um, I was like, she, what is this cameo that she's doing for people? And so then I started to look up cameo and I noticed there's all of these different Walking Dead characters that do cameos. And I was like, oh my gosh, I should find out who your favorite one is and record, like have them record a cameo to you and like talk about the podcast and how much they love it. Oh my goodness. But then I was like, but then I don't know if it's going to make them lie if they've never listened to our podcast. But then I was like, well, how am I going to find out who your favorite Walking Dead character is? And then are any of the big names actually on cameo? And then I looked and there's like 15 people and I'm like, but didn't that one die? Didn't that one die? Didn't that one die? So anyways, I was thinking about you and even though I don't like Walking Dead, I support your addiction. Oh uh, well, you know, I, actually, it's funny. I, I went this far into this into the uh, season. A lot of people have dropped off already and aren't watching it to the end. We're on the very final season of the show. Like this is spo- supposed to be it. After this, it's done forever. Oh no! But they do have a few spinoff shows. So is it really done? Not really. I don't know. So, but um, I just want to just finish it and be done with it. You know. So right. it's, it's been over ten years, I think, since they started the show. Okay. And um, yeah. Well, maybe so. you could keep the excitement alive with Cameo. <laughs> yeah. So how much are we charging for our Cameo? <laughs> well, everybody gets a Cameo from us here. But if they wanted to hear a little extra screen sharing from us, a little extra banter, where can they go? They always go to the website. That is chrisandchristineshow.com. And you always keep up all of our social media. And there's fun little teasers. And I think we almost, you do a Cameo basically like every week with a little clip, a little teaser clip for everybody, right? I sure do. I try to put it on the Twitter for sure. On the Twitter? Uh, on the Twitter. <laughs> not, the, not Twitter, but the Twitter. The Twitter. That's where, t- that just shows how old you are. <laughs> on, on the web. On, uh-huh. on the line. Uh-huh. <laughs> not online, on the line. On the line. <laughs> and um, so I'll do it a little, a call an audiogram. Now, audiograms, people hate them or love them, whatever. They but are it's basically th- cameo, right? Just not talking to the person? Well, an audiogram is basically a little audio clip of the podcast. Yeah. People use them. They share them. It just gives a little teaser to what the show is about. So maybe if you mm-hmm. want to listen to it, you can give you a little sample of it, you know, like a little taste. Like, you know, when you go to the buffet, or you go to those t- uh, wine tasting, or you go to like the uh, buffet tasting you went to yesterday. It's a little. You mean like a wedding tasting? That's what I said, buffet tasting. <laughs> and you go there, you have a little taste test of what you think. And then you're like, oh, I like this. Maybe I'll purchase this. <laughs> Or it's even better. It's like when you go to Third One Flavors, the ice cream place, Mm -hmm. and you get a little sample. Like, want to try a sample of this or try a sample of that? Well, COVID times are here, and so nobody gives out samples anymore. What? So if you would like to try us out, you can for free and tell them all the places. Oh, you know, uh, you know, the webs and the interwebs. The interwebs, and you can find us on all major podcast <laughs> players and platforms. Uh, but you always go to the source. That's chrisandchristineshow.com, yeah. and we got links to all the fantastic stuff right over there. And we'll be back with you next week. <laughs>